this morning our call to worship will be in Psalm chapter 32. It says this, uh, and praise God that this is our story. It says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man or woman against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For a day, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You're, you preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or mule without understanding, which must, must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Listen to this. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Amen. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, O oh righteous. That's all of us. And shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your word. Uh, God, I thank you that we get to do just that uh, right now together as a church family. We get to rejoice uh, and shout for joy in your name because you are uh, a God who forgives sin and forgives transgression. Uh, and the truth of Psalm 32 is true for all of us, uh, that blessed uh, are those of us in this place whose sins are forgiven. Uh, Lord, we thank you for that. I pray uh, that you would meet us here this morning. Uh, God, as we uh, sing some new and some old psalms, as we uh, dive into uh, a new book of your Bible. God, would you just meet us? Uh, would you condescend and, and show us the beauty and the glory of your son, Jesus? Uh, we love you. We thank you for God simply getting us to 2024. Uh, and I pray uh, the word of the psalmist that you would crown the year with your favor. Uh, God, we love you. Uh, we love Jesus. Help us to love him more. Uh, and to love him rightly this morning. In your son's beautiful name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, it is, I'm so sorry y'all, it's the season. Um, excuse me. Um, it is the first Sunday in January, so we need to do January birthdays. Do we have anybody... With a January birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday to
welcome everyone. So if you'll turn and wave and handshake and tell everybody how glad you are to see them this morning. I am seen with 
series in the book of Ecclesiastes titled uh, Words of Delight, uh, and that comes from chapter 12. Uh, at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher uh, makes sure to mention that these words have been truth, and these words have been guidance, and most importantly, these words have been uh, words of delight, words meant to foster uh, our joy and our enjoyment of the life that God has given, and I made sure uh, to title uh, this series something with a joyful undertone because a lot of you have probably read the book of Ecclesiastes at one point or another and thought, man, how did this make it into the Bible? Uh, and that's often how we feel. Um, the book of Ecclesiastes gets a, uh, a bad rep and a bad response often. I think the general response to those who read Ecclesiastes uh, for the first time is that. They wonder, man, how did this make it into the Bible? It certainly doesn't sound like anything else that we read, and it doesn't sound uh, very much like Jesus. Uh, it, it does not sound, uh, or it is not what we expect to see from Scripture. Uh, and unfortunately, that is the reputation that this book gets. Most people either have uh, no concept or no knowledge of this book, or they know just enough about it uh, to know that they should avoid the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, January 1st, uh, a lot of well-intentioned Bible reading plans are started, uh, and most of these people who start these year-long Bible reading plans often uh, will go through and mark out Leviticus and mark out Ecclesiastes, and that's just what people do. Uh, these books are uh, often hard to understand and often hard to find uh, the diamond in uh, the rough, and yet uh, I want to, especially with this series, strongly push against that notion uh, and those misguided judgments, and instead uh, say that to skip over or to disregard this admittedly confusing uh, book is to miss out on one of the Bible's most wise and helpful uh, voices. 
Uh, Miss Linda was telling me this morning that in something she was doing, um, each week or each month was focused on a different book of the Bible, and she said when she was not very excited when she got to Ecclesiastes, <laughs> uh, and to begin with, it's like, oh man, this is not going to feed my soul uh, for the Lord, and she said by the time that she was finished with the study of that book, she hated uh, to leave it. She hated to leave it because Ecclesiastes is truly one of those books uh, that grows on you and has the opportunity uh, to change you. Uh, my hope for this series is that as we journey through this together, that all of us will come to a place of loving and cherishing the wisdom uh, that we gain from that book. And not only that, not only merely uh, would we grow wiser, uh, but we would live better lives uh, this year and moving forward. We would live better because of the insights that we gain. Uh, in listening to other pastors preach uh, through this book, uh, they've all said uh, great things about it, but one particular, uh, he said, his church went through a series in the book of Ecclesiastes. People had, you know, a generally reprehensive uh, response to it. Uh, and he said by the end of that 10 or 12 weeks, or however long it takes, he said his church was changed. Uh, in a way that nothing else had brought about change. Uh, and that's my hope. Uh, I'm expecting that the Lord can and will do the same thing through us here. Yeah. Uh, my prayers at Ecclesiastes will, uh, for lack of a better phrase, just make us better uh, and make us wiser yeah. and more godly and more holy <laughs> and, and lovers of God. Uh, and I think we will be surprised by this book uh, in the sense that, yes, we're surprised on the outset by the words of the author, of the preacher, or the teacher, uh, as he is referred to. We're, we're surprised by these words because, again, they don't sound like what we would expect. Uh, but I also think we will be surprised uh, by the familiarity of this book. Um, this book is going to shake us, uh, but I think it will also very much resonate with us. Uh, I think we will feel at home in this book. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, that the preacher's uh, words in this book will surprise us because they don't sound like the rest of the Bible, uh, but they will be familiar to us because he's often just putting to words uh, the very things that all of us think or feel at one time or another. Uh, but we would be labeled a bad Christian uh, if we exposed those thoughts. Uh, or we feel uncomfortable voicing those uh, because it can feel like lacking faith or even being anti-Christian. Uh, this book not only welcomes, and if you hear something in my introduction to this book, hear this. This book not only welcomes your questions and your doubts, uh, but it will very much force you to question uh, and to doubt. And through the questions and the doubting, it will make you wiser. Uh, it will make us better off for it. Matthew chapter, 12, uh, Matthew chapter 7 uh, verse 24 through 27 uh, says this. This is a familiar passage. Uh, Jesus said this. Everyone then who hears these words, and this is at the <coughs> excuse me, this is at the tail end uh, of his Sermon on the Mount. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Uh, by God's grace, Ecclesiastes will be the rain uh, and the floods and the wind for you and for me uh, that reveals what parts of our faith, what parts of our lives and our knowledge of God uh, has been with good intentions built on the sand. Uh, what Ecclesiastes will do is it will reveal what is worthy to be our foundation. Uh, and maybe this, this exercise, as we get started, uh, will be helpful. I'm stealing this uh, from another preacher, but it seemed to resonate 
uh, with his congregation. So everybody do this for me. Uh, just close your eyes. Uh, and you can hold on to your wallet if that makes you feel safer. <laughs> but just close your eyes for me. Uh, and just be still and, and pause and be quiet for just a minute. Try to clear your mind of any outside thoughts and just hear my words. Now as you think with your eyes closed, I want you to answer these questions to yourself. What are you living for? And what gets you out of bed in the morning? Or what legacy do you hope to leave? Or most simply, what's your purpose? Why are you alive? And with your eyes closed, just think and answer those questions. Now, I want you to answer honestly. Don't give, uh, don't think the answers that you know you should say. Now, be honest with yourself. Give real answers. What gets you going? What gets you up out of bed? Why are you alive? Okay, you can open your eyes. The point of Ecclesiastes. Very long. <laughs> the point, that's okay, the pause was long. <laughs> the point of Ecclesiastes is to tell us that almost every single answer that we just came up with isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, this book is written to disrupt us. Uh, and in the disruption, again, its hope is that we would become wise that we would be better for it. Uh, one of my favorite Christian uh, artists, Christian songwriters, wrote a song called 17. Uh, and in the song, he essentially says that he misses when he was uh, a 17-year-old. And he says, because when he was 17, of course, he knew everything. Uh, everything in life is easier when you're 17. He says, I only saw the world in black and white, right? There's no gray, there's no middle ground, there's no nuance. I knew everything. I was so wise when I was 17. Uh, but of course, you and I get older and we start to see the world differently uh, and we realize truly uh, how little we know and how little of this world actually is black and white. Yeah. Uh, about every two to five years, I look back on the things that I believed two to five years ago and think, wow, what was going on yeah. in my head? Yeah. Uh, and I knew nothing. It's the same thing with God. The closer you get to him, the more you recognize, man, I don't know the bigness of this God at all. And that's what happens when we get older. The world just becomes uh, more complicated and our wisdom seems to get smaller uh, because we become more humble and truly more wise. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, uh, another point of this book is to essentially say to us that without the wisdom that this book desires to work in us, that all of us are like that 17-year-old that we only see the world in black and white, and we think we know far more than we do. Uh, again, this book is wisdom's disruptive voice. Uh, and I'm excited for us to dive in. Uh, welcome to church. Yeah. <laughs> but here's what I want today uh, for us to look like. Uh, we won't actually get into the text until next week. Uh, this morning, I just want to merely lay some groundwork for the book itself and get us on the same page uh, as far as some of the vocabulary of this book and then uh, set the stage for where we're headed. Uh, and while we won't pick apart and preach through uh, those first few verses that Kelly read, uh, they are very helpful to get us started. So let me read through those again. We'll pray and get started. Ecclesiastes 1 says this, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Father, I thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would make uh, your word, make this book come alive to us this morning. Uh, show us, um, God, that life with you is not in vain. Uh, that our labor in you and not, is not in vain. Uh, and yet, if we view this world through the lenses of a good life that is merely lived under the sun, uh, ultimately our life will be meaningless. Uh, God, I pray that you would shake us, you would uh, disrupt us, and you would settle us this morning on uh, the foundation uh, of your son, Jesus. God, grow us in wisdom. Uh, begin a good work in us this morning that your word says you will bring to completion. 
Uh, God, may the meditation uh, of all of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In your son's beautiful name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 All right, so here's what I want us to get through uh, this morning. And I'm going to try to... I'm going to try to make it through this within 30 to 45 minutes. But I just want us to talk through the why and the what. The why and the what of Ecclesiastes. Uh, so the why we are spending time in this book. Why this book is so important and so vital for us. Uh, and then I want to talk through the what of Ecclesiastes. Or what we can expect in the coming weeks. And what we will find in these pages and in these chapters. So if you're taking notes, point one is just this. Why? Uh, there are essentially... Three groups of people uh, that I think this book and this series will be helpful for. Uh, and these three groups are the why, or the motivation for this series. Uh, and the first group, really, uh, to be honest, it's not a group. The first group of people is just me. Um, a lot of the draw towards this book is, just to be honest, very self-serving. Uh, I want to walk through the book of Ecclesiastes because I recognize how desperately I need wisdom. Um, when a church hires a pastor in his 40s, the community says things like this. Way to go. They got a young guy. When a church hires a pastor in his 20s, the community says, what were they thinking? <laughs> so for that to be the case, as much wisdom as the older and wiser and seasoned veterans need, to shepherd a local church, uh, I need oceans more of that wisdom and grace. Now, in my pastoring and in my marriage and in every aspect of my personal life, uh, I just want to be marked by godly wisdom. I want to live wisely and live well. Uh, and I'm constantly confronted with the lack uh, of those things. Uh, so... First off, don't think for a minute that as we go through this series, that just because I'm up on this raised platform, that I'm teaching from a place of expertise, uh, because that is not uh, the case. Uh, we are in this book because I so desperately need this book to shape me and form me more and more into a wise and a composed, like we talked about last week, a follower of Jesus. Amen. And the next group of people that I believe this book speaks clearly to uh, is all of us in this room who would call ourselves believers. Uh, in the introduction to our Sunday School book, which is a book called Gentle and Lowly, uh, he talks about who he wrote Gentle and Lowly, who he wrote the book for. Uh, and he lists all these categories of uh, believers and unbelievers alike and all these things. And uh, ultimately, he ends with this. He says, this book, he says, in short, this book was written for sinners and for sufferers, uh, or in other words, for normal Christians, uh, or in other words, for all of us. Uh, and that is who the book of Ecclesiastes is for. It's for normal Christians like you and like me who want so desperately to be faithful to God in all things, but sometimes find that to be hard, uh, or at the very least, confusing. Uh, a guy named Chris Renzema uh, is a Christian artist. And the opening lines of one of his, one of his songs uh, says this. He says, The better part of my 20s spent writing songs about God on a Prozac prescription. Doesn't that seem odd? Because I believe in a gospel. He says, Because I believe in a gospel and a God who is good. Uh, but these chemicals don't always work like they should. He says, Hung up on this heartache. And then listen to this last line. And the distance between the way that I'm feeling and what I believe. Uh, and those lines right there are why we need Ecclesiastes. Uh, Chris Renzema in this song perfectly explains the tension that all of us are forced to reckon with. Uh, what this book gives us as believers is the wisdom to trust God uh, when what we believe does not match up to what we experience and what we feel. <coughs> this book gives us the wisdom to live in the tension, to live life in uh, the middle. God is good. Amen. Full stop. Right. Amen. And your life often will not be good. Right. Both of those things are equally true. Yeah. So how are we to trust God and remain faithful in that tension? 
Ecclesiastes. That's what this book offers you and me. Uh, another important thing we are offered as believers um, is simply the wisdom we need in order to live a good life uh, in the midst of a broken existence that ends with death uh, for us all. Uh, here are a few things uh, uh, some different commentators and authors have said uh, about the value of Ecclesiastes for the church. One author said this, Ecclesiastes is simply the most contemporary book in all of the Bible. Now that's high praise, especially being that it's an Old Testament book. Uh, another says this, Ecclesiastes offers a perspective on life that is extremely relevant for the church today. Uh, and finally, one commentator says, omitting this book from one's preaching schedule is a major loss for the church. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of the, one of the books uh, uh, I read, it started off and said, um, Ecclesiastes is all about wisdom. This is not verbatim, but he said, Ecclesiastes is all about wisdom, and most preachers heed the wisdom of Ecclesiastes by never preaching it. Uh, because it's just often confusing and hard to wade through uh, these waters sometimes. Uh, but here's why this book is so important. Uh, a guy named Ian uh, Provan, or Provan says this. He says, this book contributes to the correction uh, of an all too frequent imbalance throughout the ages of Christian thinking, which has sometimes presented Christianity as if it were more a matter of waiting for something than a matter of living. Uh, how often do we think of Christianity as a matter of, yes, we wait for Jesus, right. but at a certain point we have to live today. Right. More of a matter of waiting than a matter of living. So to sum up, Ecclesiastes is so important for the church because it teaches us how to live. Right. Uh, it teaches us what life should look like as we wait for the return, the second advent of Christ. Amen. Uh, maybe this example... Uh, will help us think through this. If you are uh, cutting meat uh, or cutting wood uh, or staining wood, what is a good rule of thumb? A good rule of thumb is you go with the grain. You go with the grain of the meat when you cut it, of the wood when you cut it, stain it, whatever it is, you go with the grain. Uh, here's what one author says about the purpose of wisdom literature in the Bible and specifically uh, that of this book. He says, Wisdom is concerned with the correct ordering of life. Wise action is that which integrates people uh, harmoniously into the order that God has created. Its aim then is to teach men and women these orders mm -hmm. so that they may know how to act in harmony with the world around them. Mm -hmm. uh, or to put it simpler, Wisdom literature teaches us how to go with the grain mm -hmm. of the way God created his world. Amen. Right. Uh, it teaches us how to live, and it teaches us how to live well, which Amen. we're all after. Right. We want yeah. to live well. Uh, this book was written for and is a treasure <laughs> for the church, for believers. Uh, but the third group that this book was written for uh, is the unbelievers. Uh, I love Ecclesiastes because it's truly one of the most evangelistic books in all of the Bible. Uh, as we go through this, you'll notice that there isn't really any uh, Christianized slang or polished language uh, in this book. One, uh, one author said that this book was probably written on a Monday morning by a philosophy major. <laughs> uh, <laughs> As we, go, uh, as we go through this, you'll notice that it lacks the, the language we would expect to find. Uh, this book unashamedly voices the thoughts and the questions that every person has, believer and unbeliever. We all have these big, life-altering questions. Uh, here's some of the things we'll cover in this book. How to enjoy life and be happy. Uh, the problem of evil. Money, sex, possessions, wisdom, knowledge. A satisfaction in life, death, the purpose of life, your purpose in life, the brevity of life, the unfairness of life, uh, good things happening to bad people, bad things happening to good people, yeah. and, and how frustrating and maddening this life can be. Uh, now, out of those list of things, uh, are any of those subjects questions that only Christians have? No, all of these things apply to everyone. These are the big questions of life that everyone at one point or another has. 
Now that's why Martin Luther said that we should read this noble little book, as he called it, every single day. Uh, so to answer the first question of why we are spending time in Ecclesiastes, uh, simply because we all desperately need the wisdom found in these pages. And now for what? If you think about this book like a narrative or like a story, uh, then the first three verses of Ecclesiastes are super helpful uh, because they contain three important ingredients for the story as a whole. Uh, really four if you count the author, uh, but we'll talk about that in other weeks. Uh, but the first three verses and the first three important details that we find uh, are this. Number one, the theme of the entire book. Number two, the purpose or the goal of the entire book. And finally, uh, number three, the setting of this book. The theme of the entire book is found in verse two, uh, and it's summed up in what the ESV translates vanity or vanity of vanities, or your translation might say meaningless or any host of uh, different things. They'll say vapor uh, or smoke or breath or brevity or temporary uh, or futility. Uh, and all these different words should give you uh, a look into the struggle of translators over the centuries trying to find out what this Hebrew word, uh, which is hevel, what that word truly uh, means and uh, what, it, uh, what it teaches us about life. Uh, and hevel, this word here, or hevel of hevels, uh, is, a, is a word or a phrase that is repeated 38 times. Uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes. Over half of all the times it's used in the Bible is found in Ecclesiastes. Uh, and the commentators that I've read all agree uh, that to uncover the meaning of this word, of uh, vanity, of heaven, is to gain an understanding of the entire book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I don't know how much, maybe this will help, uh, again, another example. I don't know how much time uh, some of you have spent on the water. Um, one of the most unfun things uh, that I've found in this life uh, is to get caught uh, out on the lake in an early morning fog. Um, there's something scary about not being able to see the front of your own boat uh, and not being able to see the lights of any other boats. Uh, and then you put that at night in the middle of Gunnersville, and it's just triple the scary. Uh, and I know there's a sea monster in there somewhere that's going to get us all. Uh, but there's nothing scarier than being in the midst of that fog. Uh, but the fog itself, like most things, uh, the fog itself is not the scary part. Uh, what's scary uh, is knowing that as you're out in the middle of the lake, either completely still or moving really slowly, as a smart person does, uh, because you never know if somebody else has stopped. The scary part is thinking that at any moment, uh, some Ricky Bobby in his 20-foot bullet right. is going to blow through like a horror film yeah. and just run you over. And you couldn't see his lights coming. Uh, and that is what freaks you out when you're in the middle of the fog. And the thing is, if I go home uh, after that, uh, after a morning of fog on the lake or driving over a big bridge over water and it's foggy and you can't see, if I go home after that and I tell Kelly about it, uh, she may want to talk about it and she may say something like this, uh, oh wow, that does sound spooky. Uh, what happened to the fog? Uh, and to that I would reply, well, Kelly, uh, it's fog. What, what do you What do you mean? What happened? It just it went away. Uh, I don't know what happened to it scientifically. The fog is just gone. It's it did what fog does. It just left. Uh, and she might respond to that. Oh, okay. Uh, well, what was it like? And again, this is assuming that Kelly is far less intelligent than she actually is. This is just for the example. She might say, Oh, well, what was the fog like? Can you explain it? To me, like, what did it feel like? What did it smell like? Uh, and, and I'd say, what? <laughs> it's Kelly. It's fog. <laughs> Have you? Do you not understand fog? Uh, there was. It didn't feel like anything. It. It didn't smell like anything. Fog is just kind of there. I don't understand where we're apart on this. It was fog. Uh, and she might say, 
okay, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure I believe you. Uh, did you bring any of it back so that I could see it? <laughs> and again, I would say, it, it's fog. No, I didn't bring any of it back. You can't capture it in a jar, Kelly. I can't just bring you back fog. It's fog. I, what do you not understand? And the writer of Ecclesiastes would say, that's your life. That is uh, your life. It's fog. It's it's vapor. It's real, and it's true, uh, but it's confusing, and it's an enigma, and it's here for a while, and then it's gone without a warning, and you can't explain it. You can't uh, direct it or shepherd it. You don't really have a grasp or a control of it. Uh, you just have to live through it, almost. You sit through it, uh, and if you try too hard to figure it out, you'll go crazy. It's it's maddening. It doesn't make sense. Uh, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Uh, all this vanity, it's a chasing after the wind. It's a trying to bring back home fog. You just can't do it. Uh, but what we see throughout this book uh, is that though it may seem like this in these first few verses, this preacher uh, is no cynic and he's no pessimist. Uh, the preacher of Ecclesiastes continually calls out the vanity uh, and the futility uh, and the maddening nature of this life, not in order to push us to despair and to depression. But he calls out the vanity of this life in order for us to hunger and to long for something better, uh, something that we can grasp, that we can bring home. Now, his hope for you and for me is that eventually we would get tired of chasing after the wind. Uh, and in our confused exhaustion, we would turn to and collapse in front of God, uh, who is the source of everything that we've been looking for uh, from the start. That's the theme of Ecclesiastes. That is your life. Uh, you, in the same way, you can't shepherd the wind. Uh, you can't uh, understand your life that way. That's the theme of the book, and the purpose of this book is found in the question of verse 3, when he says, what do we gain uh, from all of our toil? Uh, and a good rule of thumb, if you want to be happy in this life, uh, don't ask yourself that question ever. What do I gain from all of this toil? Uh, for the believer, as we'll see in this book, that question can be uh, difficult to answer. And for the unbeliever, that question is impossible uh, to answer. Uh, as we'll see once we get into this, the goal of Ecclesiastes is the preacher continually seeking to answer this question, how can I find gain? How can I make my life profit in this world? He walks down uh, every trail and he turns over every rock trying to find gain, trying to find a profit in this life. Uh, and I think as we go through this, his answers may surprise us. Uh, again, they're not what we expect. But that's the purpose of this book, finding gain, finding the goal of this maddening life. Uh, and then finally we get to uh, the setting at the end of verse 3. Verse 3 says this, What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils? And then we have the setting, under the sun. Under the sun. Uh, this is the perspective that the preacher takes. This phrase is used 29 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, and this is the setting or the qualifier uh, to everything he says. Most simply, under the sun just means here on earth, uh, where we all are forced to live, like it or not. Uh, and yet it carries with it this extra notion of life here on earth, yes, uh, but life uh, with a disregard for our Creator. That's what it means to live under the sun, as if under the sun is all that is. That's what the preacher means uh, by this. And what, what he'll do throughout this book uh, is continually show us uh, the vanity uh, or the meaningless or the vapor, the fog of this life under the sun on this broken and sinful earth uh, where regardless of what your life looks like, death is our portion. Uh, death finds us all. Uh, but in the same way that even though death finds the believer just the same as the unbeliever, uh, as believers, we know that we have a much different view. And
and a much different understanding of death. We have a hope that outweighs uh, the end of death. And the same is true in life under the sun. This is, this is his message. The same frustrating and maddening life uh, is the same place believers and unbelievers alike share. Uh, right? We're all on the same track, all playing in the same field. Yeah. And yet, we as believers have a hope and a joy and a purpose that outweighs the vanity of this Amen. life. Amen. Yeah. Under the sun... Uh, is the lens through which the preacher tells us about the vanity of this life in hopes that we will shift our focus away from the things around and onto the things above. Uh, or rather, onto the one above who makes the things around meaningful and makes sense. Uh, that's the setting and the purpose and the theme of this book. Uh, and I'll close with this. Ecclesiastes will be helpful uh, and it will be fruitful for us as believers. I truly believe, uh, and the reason is this, because it's honest uh, and it's unpolished and it makes room for uh, and is transparent about uh, troubles and trials. Yeah. Uh, if you've grown up in a Christianity uh, or a church background uh, that says having questions means that you lack faith, uh, then Ecclesiastes is for you. Uh, it lays out the troubles of this life and the confusion and the unfairness and the hard and the uncomfortable. Ecclesiastes says to all of us that our questions are welcome here, that God is big enough for your doubts and your confusion. Uh, one commentator describes this book as a kind of back door to Christianity uh, that allows us as believers to have uh, the sad and skeptical thoughts that we would never uh, want to enter the front door of our faith. Uh, or another way to say it, it gets us beyond the Sunday school answers. Uh, it's like that guy in Sunday school that says something and you're like, oh, that was a little much for this room. That's Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Have you had a good 2023? And the preacher would be the, the guy in the back of the room with the pipe that says, thank you. It was all vanity. That's the preacher of Ecclesiastes. He makes us uncomfortable, but he's wise. Ecclesiastes is real uh, and raw and honest. But most importantly, it leads us to the hand and the feet of Jesus. And says, find life and find meaning here. Uh, this book at times will sound pessimistic, pessimistic uh, and cynical. Uh, but as we journey through this book, I think we'll be surprised by the joy. Uh, surprised by the joy and the goodness and uh, the words of delight that we will find here. Uh, let me read this quote and then we'll be done. Philip Ryken says this. He says, remember this whenever you get frustrated, sad, angry, or disappointed with everything in life that is getting broken, falling apart, and going wrong. Remember this when you feel overwhelmed and are tempted to wonder why you should even bother. Why you should bother with your work, with your relationships, with your faith. You were made for a new and better world. The very fact that you are weary of this life is pointing you to Jesus as the only one who can truly satisfy your soul. Amen. Yeah. The book of Proverbs says that uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And Ecclesiastes, by God's grace, will be that faithful friend to all of us uh, that wounds us by showing us how meaningless uh, and how empty that our lives are without a God-centered heart and a God-centered outlook. Uh, Ecclesiastes essentially says everything that you give your attention to uh, that does not have God in the middle is a waste of your life. It's a waste uh, of your life. So I pray that uh, by the end of this book, we will, uh, like I said, be the better for it, be the wiser for it, be godlier and holier, and live more like the person uh, of wisdom, which is Jesus Christ. So why don't you stand and let me pray for us, and we'll be done. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your word.
God, we thank you for the corrective nature of your word, uh, that it continually uh, sets us uh, in the right place and teaches us how to go with the grain uh, of the world as you created it. Uh, God, show us in one hand uh, the vanity of this life apart from you and show us in the other uh, the strong hope uh, and joy and purpose and uh, security that we have uh, in a life that is wholly devoted to you. Uh, Lord, we love you. We love your son, Jesus. Help us to love him more. Uh, God, I pray for anyone in this room that does not know Jesus. Mm. God, today would be the day that their eyes open uh, to the meaningless of life without him. God, and they would find any Christian in this place uh, and ask us what it means to follow Jesus, to be found and secure in the family of God uh, and have a life promised uh, that extends beyond under the sun. Uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your son. His name I pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Yeah. 